Good evening, and I appreciate you taking the time to uh, watch this evening's lesson. This evening's lesson is entitled, These Are the Times That Try Men's Faith. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of their country. But he that stands by it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Tyranny, like hell, is not easily conquered. Yet we have this consolation with us that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. These words were written by Thomas Paine on December 23, 1776. These are the times that try men's souls. Those words, of course, were the opening words in a series of pamphlets called The American Crisis, in which Paine was attempting to stir up revolutionary spirit. He had begun it in late 1776. General George Washington had been driven out of New York. He had been chased across New Jersey and his own Congress had abandoned him. His 6,000 soldiers were anxious to leave for home uh, with their enlistments about to run out in the next two weeks. That is the setting in which Thomas Paine wrote those famous words. Earlier this week, as I sat on my front porch swing, having long ago abandoned the 24-hour news cycle that I once craved, I thought how differently my life looks today as compared to just a couple of short months ago. But this time, my focus was upon the impact that these times have had on my faith. Now, I want you to be attentive to something here. I am specifically using the term faith, not belief. For my belief in God has not been altered at all. Faith and belief are not the same thing. James tells us, Thou believest that God is one, thou doest well. The demons also believe and shudder. But what of my faith? What of your faith? What I hope to accomplish in this presentation, for it is less a sermon than a speech, it is less instruction than my feeble attempt at motivation, is to fan the flames of your faith, to revive, if it need be, that motivation to continue running your race. As a fire without oxygen dies and a runner without endurance faints, we, as the body of Christ, will wilt and die and we will drop from the true vine and be cast into the fire if we do not abide in our Lord and allow his words to abide in us. But why, you may ask, would I even dare to contemplate the possibility that such could happen to the body at Las Casas? Surely do I not know that we are strong, that we remain focused on the goal. Do I not know that the focus should be without instead of within? To be truthful, I do not know where almost all of you currently stand. There are my hopes, there are my desires for you and your faith, but I lack knowledge. I lack understanding in where you are currently positioned with your Lord. And if we be fair, you lack the same knowledge concerning me. 
Just as Thomas Paine wrote in 1776 about the times that were trying men's souls, these current times are the times that try men's faith. It was Friday, March 13th, 2020, and I was in court, a place that I know as well as my own home, because quite candidly, I feel like I spend as much time there as I do at my own home. I cannot honestly recall now, but I am sure that I had heard something about the coronavirus, but I was largely unconcerned. As I sat on the sixth floor courtroom, waiting for the judge to enter, a lawyer leaned over and told me that the word around the courthouse was that the Tennessee Supreme Court would be shutting us down. Gossip inside a courthouse is like gossip anywhere. It's prevalent and largely inaccurate. So I, for the most part, brushed aside his comments, but there was a part of me that secretly relished the idea of a break. Please, by all means, shut me down. I've about had all I can take as it is, and I would enjoy the respite. When my business concluded a short time later in the courthouse, I drove to a little gas station in Murfreesboro that has uh, the best barbecue anywhere in Murfreesboro. That's a lesson in and of itself about not judging a book by its cover. But as I sat alone in that gas station eating my lunch, I received a text alert. It had happened. The Tennessee Supreme Court had, in fact, shut us down. Effective the following Monday, there would be no court. What I felt at that time was a mixture of dread, for I would have to communicate with a number of clients and try logistically just to make sure that they knew not to be certain places and what the future might look like for their particular case. But it was also excitement for what was happening was different. It wasn't the same mundane existence that I experienced on a day-to-day -day basis. It was a crisis now, and I had to act. I called my legal assistant, who by happenstance had left the office early that day with a migraine, and I advised her of the news. I forwarded her a copy of the Tennessee Supreme Court's order, and I told her to be on standby in case I was unable to get in touch with all of my clients. And so it began. In the time that has passed since March 13th, I've let my staff go. I've moved my primary working materials from a flourishing office in Murfreesboro to my home. And like so many others across this state and this country, I have primarily lived a quarantined life away from normal human interaction. And this obviously includes interaction with the members of the church. And now that we are approaching two and a half months into these times that try men's faith, it seems like a perfect time to me to reflect. So earlier this week, as I sat on my porch swing, looking out at the fading light of day, I began to reflect, how has my faith changed, if at all, over the past two and a half months? Though that reflection was sobering and eye-opening, it was important. What do you think you see when you look at me? No doubt there are many <clears throat> who, from the outside looking in, think, well, that's Josh. He's a successful lawyer. He's got a beautiful family. What a life he must have. And to be fair, 
it would be uh, disingenuous if I said that I have not had a good life. But what do you not see? What is the reality that exists that you don't get to see? Because I largely don't allow it to be seen by people. What you don't get to see is anxiety. I, for most of my life, have suffered with anxiety. At times, the anxiety becomes so strong that it dips down into depression. That's not what you anticipate, is it? That's not what you would anticipate if you saw me in the courtroom. It's not what you would anticipate if you saw me standing in front of a class or delivering a sermon or telling a story. Because those things are suppressed. What you would see instead, what I try to let people see, is strength, resolve, determination, ability. Over the last two and a half months, as I have largely been quarantined with my family and away from that human interaction that I used to have, I have also noticed an impact on my faith. Without having that weekly ability to go and be around others of like mind, to receive encouragement from brothers and sisters in Christ, to listen to messages that make me think, that spur me to study, that motivate me to continue my own race, I have felt myself steadily slip further and further back. And so as I sat on that porch swing and I contemplated where I was, knowing that I also had been asked to deliver the Sunday night message for this coming week, I thought, what can I talk about? I don't feel motivated enough to, to deliver some rousing sermon that would encourage everyone and, and be the greatest thing that, that, that I could profess. I, 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 I don't have the motivation for that. So instead, what I decided to do was just go with honesty. Raw, unvarnished honesty. Because if I had to guess, I would say that there are at least a handful, maybe more, of you who have experienced and felt the same thing. Maybe it's a job that was lost or severely curtailed. Maybe it was the inability to communicate in person with family and friends that you had looked forward to on a daily or weekly basis. But something through all of these times that we're going through right now has impacted you. And it's impacted you in a negative way. Now, again, I know that, you know, normally what we like to do is we like to get up and we like to give sermons or teach classes or give presentations that make the audience feel great about themselves and, and leave motivated and encouraged. And I certainly do not intend to simply be the naysayer today, to be the guy that brings you down. But I do feel that these are important times for us to recognize what we're going through and the impact that it has on us. So as I sat on my porch swing and I was contemplating where I was and how this has impacted me and why I felt the way I did, why I felt my faith was moving in one direction versus the other, there were certain scriptures that came to mind. 
If you're watching this and you have a Bible handy, if you want to turn to the second uh, book of Corinthians in chapter 11, it's actually one of my favorite places in the Bible, although what is described is very horrific. It's encouraging. Paul is talking. Uh, he's the writer here. And he's describing the things that he has gone through. Beginning in verse 24 of chapter 11, Paul says, From the Jews five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Now let's stop there for just a minute. What does that mean? 40 stripes minus one. It means he was beaten. He was beaten. He was taken. He was most likely shackled to some type of a post on the ground that would have bent him over, and then they would have taken uh, various forms of whips, and they would have whipped him. Forty times minus one. Thirty-nine licks. Three times, I was beaten with rods. Once, I was stoned. It's important to note here also, when he says that he was stoned, in that time when people were stoned, they were not stoned simply as a punishment uh, that they would recover from. The intent was to inflict death, to cause death. So when Paul talks about being stoned, in my mind's eye, I imagine Paul being pummeled with rocks to the point that those assaulting him believed him to be dead. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent in the deep. In journeys often in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. Now think about that for a moment. Think about that in conjunction with what you are going through right now. Think about the absolute difficulty that Paul experienced, not once, not for some brief period of time. I mean, my goodness, when he talks about receiving 40 stripes minus one, when he talks about being beaten with rods, when he talks about being stoned, when he talks about being shipwrecked, those are not minute periods in time. Those are things that occurred and then he had to recover from. Think about what Paul went through. Now, I raise that for a couple of reasons. One, because I think it's important for us to have some reference, something that we, as we go through these times in our life, can look to and we can say, I can do this. I can make it. And I know I can make it because I have an example of someone who came before me who went through far worse than what I'm going through, 
And not only did he survive it, but he maintained his faith. He kept running his race. What Paul went through, I cannot compare to. I I can't say that what I'm experiencing is anywhere even in the same ballpark as what Paul has gone through. Keep that in mind and flip over in the same book to chapter 12. Because here is a passage that I would I would I would like at some point to do just a whole class on. It's a very interesting passage, but I'm for today's purposes I'm going to have us focus on one specific element. In chapter 12 beginning in verse 1, Paul says, "It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast." I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body, I do not know, or whether out of the body, I do not know, God knows. Such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one I will boast, yet of myself I will not boast except in my infirmities. For though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will speak the truth. But I refrain lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. Now I want you to stop right there. You have to keep in mind when you read what Paul writes, that Paul was constantly being dogged by the Judaizing teachers, constantly being questioned about his authority, about his apostleship constantly having to defend his apostleship. And here, Paul's saying, I don't need to boast. Now, it is my opinion, based on this particular passage, that Paul is saying, uh, kind of the way we would say it maybe, is, I could boast. Uh, believe me, I could, I could tell you things that I have seen and heard that no one could outdo. But I'm not doing that because it's not about me. But I want you to listen to the very next thing, and no doubt you've heard lessons about this in the past. Beginning in verse 7, Paul says, And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Now stop right there. This is such beautiful language. And lest I should be exalted above measure. Paul says, in order to prevent me from being exalted above measure in order to to keep me from falling into the trap of being boastful about what I've seen about what I know to keep me humble a thorn in the flesh was given to me now this is important to me because what that suggests to me is that this is not something that Paul had his entire life. This immediately follows his uh, speaking about this man who was called up to the third heaven, who went to paradise, who heard words that it's unlawful for any man to utter. 
who within that context is saying, I'm not going to boast. He immediately then says, and lest I should be exalted above measure, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Now, the very next thing is really where I want to spend the time at least contemplating and focusing. And before we read it, I want you to remember, we just read in chapter 11 about the shipwrecks, the beatings, the stonings, the hunger, the thirst, all of the perils that he has encountered. Keep that in mind and then look at verse 8 of chapter 12. Paul says, Concerning this thing, what thing? The thorn in the flesh. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. Now, I do not suggest that Paul enjoyed the beatings, the stonings, the shipwrecks, the being in peril. He didn't enjoy those things. But, we're told here that he pled with the Lord. He was pleading. Now, a pleading is not simply, I would like for you to do this. A pleading is more akin to uh, a begging, a strong request, a strong desire. I am pleading with you. And the Bible tells us, that he pled with the Lord three times that it might depart from me, that the thorn in the flesh, whatever that thorn in the flesh was, Paul begged the Lord three times, take it away from me. Please, take it away from me. I've been... I've been beaten for your name's sake. I've been shipwrecked for your name's sake. I've been... I've been in peril for your name's sake. I've been betrayed for your name's sake. This thorn in the flesh, please, three times, take it away. Can you relate to that? I can. Maybe not to the degree or extent that Paul could. But I can relate to it. I can relate to the idea of begging God to change some current circumstance. I can relate to begging God to allow certain things in my life to either happen or not happen. I can relate to that. And that's where we get into the idea of our faith. Because as the world takes hold of you, and as the world creeps closer and closer in and as your focus becomes more directed over toward those worldly things by necessity the Lord gets pushed further and further away we begin oftentimes to rely upon our own ability to change our circumstances or we rely on things of the world to make us feel better to change our attitude to give us hope to produce excitement instead of looking to the Lord so I can relate to some degree when Paul says that three times he pleaded with the Lord that it might depart from him. 
But then, in what is one of the most powerful messages succinctly delivered in Scripture, verse 9, Paul says, And he said to me, he being the Lord, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Can you imagine that? Can you picture that? Can you picture Paul, maybe on his knees, pleading with the Lord three times, Lord, please, this thorn in the flesh that you gave me, this messenger of Satan that was given to me to buffet me, Lord, please take it away. Take it away, Lord. Please, I beg you. And the Lord says, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. Man, that's powerful. So in these times that we face, these times that try men's faith, maybe you, like me, are a person who, because of the things that occur in the world, the things that occur in your immediate life, maybe you're a person that struggles with the anxiety that that causes, the depression that can set in. Maybe you're a person that struggles with just the idea of uncertainty, of not knowing what the future is. If that's the case, should we not go back and look at things like this and understand that the same thing applies to us that applies to Paul? His grace is sufficient for us. One of the most difficult aspects that I have experienced over the past two and a half months is the complete loss of fellowship with my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. We have made valiant efforts at continuing to gather remotely, to continue to promote God's Word. But one thing is absolutely for sure, is that even with all the marvels of technology that we now possess, there is nothing that replaces the fellowship of the body. So when we go back to the purpose of this lesson, I said early on that it would be my feeble attempt to motivate you. You may look at this lesson and say, goodness gracious alive, that was about as depressing a lesson as I've ever heard. And that's okay. I told you it would be raw. I told you it would be unvarnished. I want you, more than anything, to do a self-evaluation. When I was on that porch swing, the way that I thought about it in my mind was this has been a midterm. Everything that has led up to this point should have prepared me if I had paid attention if I had studied, if I had done what I was supposed to do, everything up to this point would have prepared me to pass this midterm. Well, what was the test? The test was a sudden and severe disruption in your everyday life. 
a sudden and severe disruption of the body of Christ. How did I respond? How did you respond? Today is a day for self-evaluation because fortunately for me and for you, we have not had our final exam yet. Our final grade has not been posted. Over the past two and a half months, has our faith strengthened? Has our faith increased? Has our love for the body increased? Has it been manifested in some way? Or have we slowly slipped backwards to a point where if this were the final exam, we would fail? That's a question that only you can ask for yourself and answer for yourself. I've asked the question of myself. I want us to be better. I want you to be better. Better today than you were yesterday. Better tomorrow than you will be today. I want us to focus on the fact that the Lord's grace is sufficient for us. I want us to focus on the fact that as we so often say when we are together, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Let us now believe that that is the case. Let us put those things into practice. Let us build each other up in all the ways that are available to us so that we are ultimately successful. We have seen many lessons. Um, Chuck has done a great job. Cody has done a great job continuing to bring us valuable lessons from God's Word. I look forward to a day where I will actually be able to speak to you in person. But until then, do some self-evaluation. These are the times that are trying men's faith. How will we come out on the other end? Thank you for watching. I trust that each of you are healthy, you're safe, and that things in your life are going well. But remember that even if they're not, we have the best place to go of anybody in the world. And that's to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Thank you.